let me now introduce the next uh, speaker, who is uh, uh, Jaime um, uh, Aguilera. Uh, Jaime is a bio molecular biologist uh, specialized in uh, microbial uh, biotechnologies. Uh, he is a senior scientific officer in the food ingredients and packaging unit here uh, at the EFSA. And now he will talk about, about the innovation in the food improving agents and other regulated products obtained by microbial fermentation. Please, Jaime, thank you. Thank you, David, and good morning to all. Well, when I was asked to give a, a talk about the innovation uh, of food improving agents, I thought to myself, um, okay, as, as an assessor, perhaps I know the person best places to go, uh, talk about innovation uh, in the sense of, of research, because I'm, I'm not a developer, I'm not a researcher. So I thought that uh, the best thing would be uh, to look at the innovation from the perspective of, of an assessor and to show how innovation in the products leads to innovation in risk assessment methodologies and in risk assessment criteria. And for this, I, I, I would like to remember the first talk we had in this in this uh, in this pharmaceutical school from from Takis from from the European Commission, who said that uh, product development and development risk assessment has to has to go high, side by side or, or hand by hand. And uh, what I would like to do to, to give today to you is a perspective on how the scientific developments, the scientific advances, not only produces developments and innovations in the products leading to new process, new products, but also are the uh, driving force to development of new risk assessment technologies, risk assessment tools, which with we assessors are able uh, to better assess those products and to assess also new products for which we were not initially familiarized. And uh, to illustrate this, I'm going to talk uh, about products obtained by microbial biotechnology. And why is that? Well, first of all, because it's my specialty. But second, and for this, I also would like to, to remember the talk given on uh, the day before yesterday by my colleague Christina from ESA. Um, microbial fermentation is one of the main uh, um, ways to produce substance that we add to our food and on our, our feed. Uh, Christina already told you that full enzymes, for example, more than 90% of them are obtained by microorganisms. If we go to feed enzyme and feed amino acids, the share uh, of products produced by microorganisms is, is also more overwhelming. Uh, there are just a few ones not obtained from microorganisms. From food additives, uh, there are more balance between additives produced from microbes and additives produced using other techniques, such as purification or chemical synthesis. But I'm sure that all of you have found in the levels of the food you buy, sometimes these this, uh, small numbers and codes, uh, that means things that, that we are used to in taking our food, like for example, uh, baking powder or uh, sweeteners, all of them are obtained also by microbes. And uh, what do we need to characterize as a risk assessor uh, a microbe uh, uh, when we are assessing a final product? And for this, you, we had an excellent talk yesterday by Liv Herman. Uh, so I will not review everything, but just uh, uh, very shortly to say that we need to assess everything from the microbe that can have an impact in the final product. We need to know if the microbe could eventually be pathogenic particularly if the microbe is viable in the final product, such as in the case of biopesticides or animal probiotics. But we also need to know if they produce certain kind of substances that might end in the final product, causing a, a, a reason of concern. And how do we do that? Well, we can apply a battery of, uh, of uh, different kind of analysis, for example, for identification, Obviously, methods based on phenotypic uh, are, uh, are uh, from years outdated. Uh, we rely on sequence analysis of certain housekeeping genes and comparison between the strain we are assessing and uh, already known uh, uh, strains and known species. This method has, has its limitations, particularly when the housekeeping genes of different species are very similar. Sometimes the, the, the resolution capacity is not so high. 
To test the toxicity, the toxicity, for example, we rely very much on uh, literature search. What do we know? What the science know about, about this particular species? But there are also some tests that you can apply. You can, for example, study whether uh, your microbe can, pre can, can produce some antimicrobials, for example. Or you can uh, um, do some, some kinds of uh, molecular breakdown or chemical breakdown with mass spectrometry to see whether they produce some kind of compounds that could be um, that could be uh, toxigenic. The same for the pathogenicity uh, and virulence. Uh, you can test in vitro, for example, whether the strain is cytotoxic. This is requested particularly for bacillus. There are other tests that you can do, but most of them are still uh, relying on the uh, literature and the scientific knowledge we have. For antimicrobial resistance until, until certain years, and still is doing uh, very often, what you do is to challenge the micro you are you are assessing against a battery of, of antimicrobials and see whether it's resistant or, or it's sensitive. Uh, now it comes the first driver of innovation, which is the genetic modifications. Uh, genetic modifications are already well known, uh, and today is not an innovation, but it was in time. And it was so important innovation that today practically one half of the microbes that are used to obtain uh, products uh, to be at the full of air are genetically modified. Genetically modified supposedly is in sign of revolution in this technology because you can eventually take a piece of DNA from another species and put it there into your microbe. You can, for example, increase productivity by adding multiple copies of the same gene. Here, for example, of, of the left side, you have the protein profile of a wild type microbe used for protein production. And this is the protein profile of a, a recombinant strain uh, who has been an engineer, uh, engineered to produce only one uh, enzyme. So you can see that practically all the, all the proteins that this, uh, that this micro produce are the enzyme of interest. In addition, you can, for example, pick an, a gene uh, encoding for an enzyme of, of your interest, for example, phytase from certain bacterial species and transferred to uh, um, um, filamentous fungi that you have very well set up in your lab for protein production. In addition, you can go further and instead of uh, isolating certain proteins, for example, chemosin that was isol isolated for, uh, from cow milk, you can just take uh, the gene from the cow milk and put it into the yeast. And so you have chymosine much more pure and much wider quantities than if you had to uh, extract and purify the chymosine from the milk. So this has constituted, as I say, a revolution. And of course, first drive of innovation for technology, first drive of innovation for risk assessment. You have to add assessing the genetic modifications to the battery of the things you have to assess and you have to characterize when you are looking at the microbes which are used to produce additives, enzymes, biopesticides and all these kind of products. And how do you do that? Well, I'll team very recently and uh, still it's very used. Basically, there are three steps. You have to characterize the organism before the genetic modification. Then you have to characterize the DNA that you put in there or you take it from there and how do you do it. And finally, you have to characterize the effects in the final DMN that this genetic modification has. And to do that, you need to know a complete history on how these genetic modified microorganisms, which I will call GMM from now on, has been has been developed. You need to know which DNA has been put in, which is the vector that has been used. A vector, uh, for those who don't know, is a vehicle, a piece of longer DNA who acts as a vehicle to put your gene of interest in, in, the, in the microbe. This vehicle normally has uh, marker genes for selection who are able to confer the microbe, the ability to resist on antimicrobials, as this is very important because it could constitute a cause of concern in the final product under certain circumstances. You need to know exactly how this DNA has been put into the strain, how it has been integrated into the genome of the strain, if it has integrated, but because there are cases into the, in which the DNA is still free out of the genome. And to know this, you need a, a battery of experiments, basically southern blots, PCRs, direct uh, uh, sequences of the DNA too, just to see that uh, your gene of interest has been inserted in the place that you think 
you have been inserted and, and there has not been unintended insertions. With this, you can assess genetic modifications, you can characterize one genetic modification, two, three genetic modifications, you can do it. But once you can do introduce a genetic modification, you can eventually introduce anyone and how as many as you want. And that's what researchers do. They put the map of the, of the metabolic pathway and they identify the metabolic pathway leading to the product they want to produce. And then they say, All right, okay, what are the clue genes in this pathway? Okay, this, this gene is clue, this gene is clue, this gene is clue. So let's upregulate it. Let's put more copies or let's include genes from other species which are more efficient. And what are the pathways that are competing for this product? Maybe this one. Let's delete the gene, let's delete this other gene and this other gene. This is called metabolic engineering. So it's reshuffling the pathway leading to the product of interest. So you maximize the product and you minimize byproducts. With this, as I said, you can introduce as many genetic modifications as, as, as you want. And assessing three or four, it, it's doable in the way that I have uh, told you before. But when you have 13 genetic modifications, for example, this trichoderma resi able to produce fetase, uh, the, the process is, is taking more time and it's been more complex and difficult. And you can add uh, Hamas progenitus nice, for example, with 16 genetic modifications. A basilic uniform is producing amylase with 32. And we have a yeast producing stabiol, which is this sweetener that uh, is also obtained from plants, it's naturally produced from plants, who has up to 43 genetic modifications. And this is the phase that an assessor gets when it has to assess 43 genetic modifications in the way that I have just explained to you before. It's really a complex, time-consuming and prone to error uh, uh, process. So again, innovation for metabolic engineering and multiple genetic modifications, we need innovation for risk assessment. And to innovate in risk assessment, we go to the science. Scientific advance. And um, this is the scientific advance that has supposed a breakthrough uh, in scientific developments as, and also in risk assessment methodologies, which is the whole genome sequence. World genome sequence, to make the story short, is the capacity to have the full genome of a living being absolutely sequenced and, and, and stored in your computer. Uh, this is still a very difficult and time-consuming uh, job for higher eukaryotes, but for microbes it has been every time more easy and more doable. The basic principle is very easy. You take the DNA from your microbe, you cut out into small pieces, you sequence every of these small pieces, and then you let your computer to find the overlapping regions and then mount in all the small sequences like a puzzle until you have the full genome of the microbe resolved. Of course, there are a lot of technical uh, difficulties and details in this that I'm going to, to get in, but the, the basic principle is, is that one. So, the full, the whole genome sequence has supposed a breakthrough in, in technology, not only because the capacity to sequence everything, but also because the price has been lowering time by time. At the beginning of uh, the 21st century, uh, a sequencing facility with a sequencing machine, machine, you could sequence in a day some thousands of, uh, of uh, uh, bases at the price of some thousands of dollars. Today, you are able to sequence millions, uh, 10 millions, more than 10 millions of bases at a price of less than one euro cent per base. And this graph uh, has data until 2014, uh, but I can assure you that for 2014 until today, this trend has been increased. So now we are, we are able to sequence incredible amounts of uh, data and an incredible amount of uh, low price for a few hundreds of euros. And in a few weeks, you can have in your computer the full genome of your microbe uh, appropriately resolved and appropriately analyzed. This means data, lots of data, big data that arrived then uh, to the technology. This is a graph who represents the amount of full genomes 
that are in the gene bank, which is the main repository, uh, public repository for, for genetic sequence, from about 2000 until 2015. In the 2000s, there were about some tens, maybe, of genomes. In 2015, there were more than 4,000 genomes in that repository. Unfortunately, I couldn't find data more recent, but the other day I was doing a search by myself, and on 9th of September of this year, in this gene bank, there were more than 30,000 full sequence of genomes of bacteria of different species, only bacteria. If we take into account not only bacteria, but also yeast, filamentous fungi, and different sequences of the same species, because you can sequence many strains. In total, uh, there were more than 70,000 full genomes. With all this incredible amount of data, of course, my informaticians thought, what an incredible amount of things you can do. And they developed two star databases. Databases in which you can analyze your data and compare with already known sequences so you can identify the taxonomy of the strains you have uh, recently sequenced. You can find whether uh, the strains can antimicrobial resistant genes or genes involved in violence. You can also have a hint on the proteins that uh, every gene could qualify just by comparing uh, with genes already known. And uh, they have improved, and it's improving day by day, the tools by which different sequences from different genomes might be put together and compared to show the relationship between the different strain and the different species. So uh, with this, we say, OK, if we incorporate this to the risk assessment, we might have solved the issue of assessing the genetic modifications, among many other things. We have only to compare the strain before the genetic modification with the genome of the strain after genetic modification, localize all the genetic modifications that have been taking place, and send them to the database to see what has happened. In this example, for example, the researchers have eliminated this piece of DNA and has inserted this one and this one. So we now do not need to go to the southerners to the PCR genetic modification after genetic modification. You can have a full picture in just one shot of everything that has been introduced and everything that has been deleted and go to the databases and see what it is. So you can identify and characterize the genetic modification much better. Not only the genetic modification, because as I said, you can look for genes of concern involving antimicrobial resistance, involving violence, involving pathogenicity. You can have a much better idea on the taxonomical uh, identity of the strain you are characterizing. Uh, so we include this, and now it's included in the, in the normal risk assessment of microbes used uh, uh, to produce substance that we add to our food and our feed. Uh, and in, you can both find the guidance of the characterization of microorganisms used for the productions of feed additives and also for food enzymes. And there you will see that the characterization is based on a whole genome sequence. Well, what are the improvements uh, with respect to how we did before? Well, we can find antimicrobial resistant genes uh, present in strains that are susceptible to the corresponding antimicrobial. We have found sometimes antimicrobial resistant genes using the genetic, during the genetic modification that were supposed to be eliminated from the final strain, but were already there. Some genetic rearrangement uh, also uh, that we were first unable to, to localize and to identify. But the most important thing, well, sometimes the producing strains were not well identified with, with uh, the techniques uh, of sequencing just one or two genes. Now we are able to identify them much better. But on top of that, and perhaps more importantly, the reduction on the risk assessment uh, has been uh, very notable. Now we are much faster and we are much efficient because with just one analysis of the full genome, we can have a much better idea on the characterization of the strain. Of course, this is the only, not the only one tool. We still need to go back to other kind of analysis, but uh, with the time and with the development of these technologies, 
uh, world genome sequence uh, is getting more, more and more importance on the characterization and nowadays assessing or characterizing a micro based on world genome sequence if the data is good enough and is, and, and is well performed is much faster and much more efficient and cheaper, I would say. But of course, this is not the end of the story. I mean, world genome sequence analysis is something that is now and still under development, still being improved. Uh, so what we did a few years ago is to include uh, world genome sequence analysis as a tool for risk assessment into the program of the colloquium that EFSA we organized on the omics technologies as a tool for risk assessment. A colloquium is a, a, a kind of meeting organized by EFSA in which we gather experts uh, from different backgrounds and, and, and from different origins uh, to acquire knowledge about uh, new ideas, new technologies, new field of science and development and, and discuss how and in which way we can incorporate this into our risk assessments. From that colloquium, there were some, some conclusions. Uh, there were a general agreement that the tool is very useful, but still there are some improvements to do, particularly standardization. We need uh, ways to internationally accept, accept standards uh, for quality of the sequence data, uh, for uh, <clears throat> analyzing and, and collating the data. There is also limitation, the database, that uh, they are uh, used, they depend on the budget of the corresponding institution that they that they maintain it. And so the technology is used is useful, but needs some developments. So again, another driving for innovation, and that's why uh, we came at with uh, we put together also experts on molecular biology, on microbiology, on bioinformatics, and we issued a statement. Uh, in which we try to standardize and to formalize the minimum requirements uh, of world genome sequence for the purposes of the ESA assessment, in a way that at least the minimum uh, set of information, the minimum quality and uh, the minimum thresholds of comparison with a known sequence are set in a way that applicants can have this standard and all of them can reflect to this document to send the data uh, uh, to EFSA for assessment. And not only that, we are, we are developing more tools. We are now in a project in which we are developing a tool that will be useful to uh, uh, analyze the whole genome sequence of uh, microbes used to produce all kinds of systems, tailor-made for the EFSA purpose for risk assessment. Is ongoing and is expected to have the results in, in the next years. This is the situation of uh, innovation as from today. But now I want to talk about the innovations that is going to come. Innovation for the future. What comes next? Genetic modification and world genome sequence is just a starting point. Now we have a new tools that researchers are doing that is going to, uh, to produce new kind of developments. Uh, for example, and now in, in, in here in this part of the slide, you can see that these researchers have been able to improve the riboflavin production from a lactic acid bacteria with a technology called gene editing that has the capacity to modify the behavior of the genes with all the need to, need to introduce anything from outside or to eliminate anything. So nothing related to genetic modifications, as I have explained before. With this technology, researchers are able, for example, to fine tune. They are able to dysregulate uh, pathways which are competing with riboflavin productions. And they were able also to deregulate pathways that are using riboflavin as a substrate in a way that they optimize the production of riboflavin just uh, touching very tiny parts of the DNA in a very, very targeted way so they can reshuffle the, meta the metabolism of the, of the bacteria without the need to introduce nothing new. More interestingly, perhaps genome minimization. Uh, these researchers were able to remove more than 35% of the genome of, of a Bacillus subtilis, 
more than uh, 1,500 genes were eliminated uh, so that this cannot be called Bacillus subtilis anymore. It's a kind of artificial platform with the minimum amount of genes necessary for its own maintenance and all the rooms we have free from the genome, we can use to put the gene of interest that we want to produce the, the, the proteins or the compounds that we are interested in. Not only bacteria uh, or fungi can be platform for uh, production of, of compounds. Now, for example, uh, microalgae has demonstrated a very, very, very interesting uh, production factory uh, on, for oils, for example. And which is even more new and, 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 and more like, like science fiction is what we call xenobiology. For example, in this example, the researchers were able to recodify the genetic code in a way that certain codons could identify uh, amino acids which are not part of the 20 amino acids that are a component of the natural proteins. For example, they were able to recode one stop codon to be able to identify one non-canonical amino acid. In this other example, they were able to recodify one codon to recognize instead of methionine another non-canonical amino acid of synthesis. The product is so, something totally new to nature and the microbiome is, is also something totally new to nature. It has a new genetic code, enhanced genetic, genetic code, who is able to incorporate more amino acids than uh, which are naturally uh, occurring in proteins. So they are produced in this case, the example was a, a nisin. Nisin, for example, is a protein who has some antiseptic properties and can be used as food additive. This optimized nisin, for example, incorporates amino acid that does not occur in nature. All these uh, developments are now in the labs, but uh, in the next decades, all these developments are going to be into the plate of the risk assessors and probably it will be into all plates in a very real sense. Uh, incorporation of all these new technologies has led to the concept of synthetic biology. Synthetic biology is something that is now under development, it's very complex, but the principles are very easy. You want to achieve some kind of product, what you get is uh, to the building blocks, a piece of membrane, a piece of basic DNA, basic set of genes to ensure maintenance of, of, of the structure of the membrane, some maybe some organelles, whatever you need. You use computers to simulate how this can be assembled and manipulated to produce, and then you assemble the genetic pieces and you have an absolutely artificial organism able to produce exactly what you are intended that can be something totally new to nature. Synthetic biology is a continuum uh, uh, um, concept because it incorporates new technologies with all technologies. In this figure, for example, you can see that synthetic biology can be from products very familiar with uh, very few artificial manipulations to something which is totally new. You can incorporate uh, classical mutagenics, for example, Wherever you incorporate more new technologies, vector transformations of genetic modifications, synthetic genes, synthetic genomes. So there is a, there is a continuum from something natural to something totally uh, synthetic. So a product of synthetic biology has not a clear cut. It's not only this one or only this one or only this one. Any development can incorporate more or less synthetic biology. So, another innovation of synthetic biology, what do we do for the assessment? That's exactly what the Commission asked us uh, uh, a couple of years ago. They asked us, uh, EFSA, uh, what is coming from synthetic biology that you may be in the need to assess and are you ready to assess it? So again, uh, we put together a working group of experts and we evaluated the guidance that we have today to characterize microbes and we tested on whether they are uh, suited to characterize microbes with synthetic biology. We issued two opinions. One focuses on environmental risk assessment and molecular characterization, and the other, which is very recently, focused uh, in the use of these products of synthetic biology for food or for feed. Um, what do we do this? 
based on case studies. We selected and arranged as case studies, among them those that I have explained it a couple of slides ago, from something very familiar, a couple of simple genetic modification, to something totally new, a theoretical concept of a xenovariant. We have an array of this case study, and we just try to assess them using our guidance. And uh, assess them in, in the way we assess, we assess the microbes. So simply looking at everything we have to look when we are characterizing a microbial strain. And what did we, what did we found? Well, we found that uh, synthetic biology might bring new hazards, particularly for xenobiology. If you are introducing in nature, new genetic codes, new amino acids, new proteins, which does not occur in nature, obviously you need to know whether, how they are going to interact uh, with, the, with the living being, how they are going to interact into the body of the consumer, and uh, which are the byproducts that this, this, could be, this could be produced. And to avoid and to assess new hazards, we need new guidance and new tools, new tools on how to assess horizontal gene transfer, how to assess and characterize this uh, xenobiotic DNA. We need new model systems. So we need work to do in the future to develop uh, risk assessment tools. And particularly, and this is the last part uh, of, of my talk today, we need to uh, learn and to develop ways to assess the effects of these new products into the human microbiome, which is something that we have had forgotten uh, in the risk assessment field, but now we are realizing of its importance. The human microbiome, particularly the gut microbiome, probably all of you have uh, heard uh, about it because it's more and more uh, in the media and, and everywhere. The typical fun facts, you know, you have more microbes in your body than your own cells. One kilo of your weight is not you, it's the microbiome <laughs> that is in your gut. We know that they are involved not only in helping us to digest, but also in keeping uh, awake and ready of immune system providing with nutrients that we cannot uh, that we cannot synthesize by ourselves but there is more more evidence that they are involved in all kind of diseases not only inflammatory uh, gut diseases but also allergy diabetes even autism and other brain disorders and overall is highly influenced by the diet and then with this new development of science the assessors ask to themselves okay is something that we have to do as assessors to take into account the gut microbiome. And we ask to ourselves, all these additives, flavoring, novel foods that we are introducing to our data could have a negative impact in the microbiome, leading to an altered abnormal microbiome that could be uh, responsible to some kind of disease. Or even more, could all these molecules be transformed by a healthy microbiome into products that could be dangerous for us. Well, there are some, of course, the majority, the, the, the reply you can anticipate is no for the majority of the cases, but there are some evidence that are coming uh, that for certain cases, you might need to pay attention to that. There are certain emulsifiers, for example, that has been shown to alter the, the gut microbiome in healthy individuals. And in ex vivo experiments, these same emulsifiers were able to produce inflammatory uh, process in the gut epithelium. We know, for example, uh, uh, a coloring Sudan 1. Sudan 1 is a coloring uh, agent which is uh, forbidden in, in many parts of the world to be used in food because it's metabolized to produce uh, carcinogenic compounds. This metabolization is done by human gut microbiota which is a thing that we have learned afterwards. So we have some uh, elements to know that maybe we should start paying attention as assessors to the human microbiota. And we have asked ourselves, okay, can we take uh, the human and the animal microbiomes as an endpoint for the risk assessment? Can they be they considered as a kind of organ to look at for possible effects of additives and other solutions that we add to food? And uh, if yes, are we ready? What, do we, what else do we need to know? Which capabilities do, should we develop? And this is when, in what we are now. This is the more recent projects we are uh, implementing in NEFSA related to innovation in the risk assessment of uh, microbial uh, products. 
It's a joint effort with the Spanish and the French uh, Research Agency, in uh, which we are going to review the state of the art regarding uh, the knowledge of the microbiome. And we're going to critically apprise and to establish a kind of roadmap on what are the capabilities that we need to develop to be able to incorporate the human and animal microbiomes to our risk assessment. With this, I think I have uh, tried to tell you how science drives for innovation in the products, but at the same time drives for innovation in the risk assessment. And to conclude, I would like to uh, bring some recommendations by the scientific committee from the documents that I present you before, evaluation of the existing guidance for products that are to come on synthetic biology. Uh, I'm not going to read it one by one, but the main idea is that we need international for We need international agreed and harmonized methodologies to assess products that we all countries are going to find in your plates. And also uh, a, a, a point in that the omics technologies, including Wodium sequence, is going to get more and more importance in the characterization of all these new products. And uh, with this, I thank you very much, and I think this is the end of my presentation.